Leviathan, or the matter, for me and power of a commonwealth, ecclesiastical and civil. Book by Thomas Hobbes. Narrated by Andrew. Originally published in 1651. This is a great audiobook production, created for research, study, and discussion purposes. Chapter 20. Of Dominion Paternal and Despotical. A commonwealth by acquisition is that, where the sovereign power is acquired by force. And it is acquired by force, when men singly, or many together by plurality of voices, for fear of death, or bonds, do authorize all the actions of that man, or assembly, that hath their lives and liberty in his power. Wherein different from a commonwealth by institution. And this kind of dominion, or sovereignty, differeth from sovereignty by institution, only in this, that men who choose their sovereign, do it for fear of one another, and not of him whom they institute. But in this case, they subject themselves to him they are afraid of. In both cases they do it for fear, which is to be noted by them, that hold all such covenants, as proceed from fear of death, or violence, void. Which if it were true, no man, in any kind of commonwealth, could be obliged to obedience. It is true, that in a commonwealth once instituted, or acquired, promises proceeding from fear of death, or violence, are no covenants, nor obliging, when the thing promised is contrary to the laws. But the reason is not, because it was made upon fear, but because he that promiseth, hath no right in the thing promised. Also, when he may lawfully perform, and doth not, it is not the invalidity of the covenant that absolveth him, but the sentence of the sovereign. Otherwise, whensoever a man lawfully promiseth, he unlawfully breaketh. But when the sovereign, who is the actor, acquitteth him, then he is acquitted by him that exhorted the promise, as by the author of such absolution. The rights of sovereignty the same in both. But the rights and consequences of sovereignty are the same in both. His power cannot, without his consent, be transferred to another, he cannot forfeit it, he cannot be accused by any of his subjects of injury, he cannot be punished by them. He is judge of what is necessary for peace, and judge of doctrines, he is sole legislator and supreme judge of controversies. And of the times and occasions of war and peace, to him it belongeth to choose magistrates, counselors, commanders, and all other officers and ministers and to determine of rewards, and punishments, honor, and order. The reasons whereof, are the same which are all edged in the precedent chapter, for the same rights, and consequences of sovereignty by institution. Dominion pattern all how attained not by generation, but by contract. Dominion is acquired two ways, by generation, and by conquest. The right of dominion by generation, is that, which the parent hath over his children, and is called pattern all and is not so derived from the generation, as if therefore the parent had dominion over his child because he begot him. But from the child's consent, either express, or by other sufficient arguments declared. For as to the generation, God hath ordained a man a helper, and there be always two that are equally parents, the dominion therefore over the child should belong equally to both. And he be equally subject to both, which is impossible, for no man can obey two masters. And whereas some have attributed the dominion to the man onely, as being of the more excellent sex, they misreckon in it. For there is not always that difference of strength or prudence between the man and the woman, as that the right can be determined without war. In commonwealths, this controversy is decided by the civil law, and for the most part, but not always, the sentence is in favor of the father. Because for the most part commonwealths have been erected by the fathers, not by the mothers of families. But the question lieth now in the state of mere nature, where there are supposed no laws of matrimony, no laws for the education of children. But the law of nature, and the natural inclination of the sexes, one to another, and to their children. In this condition of mere nature, either the parents between themselves dispose of the dominion over the child by contract, or do not dispose thereof at all. If they dispose thereof, the right passeth according to the contract. We find in history that the Amazons contracted with the men of the neighboring countries, to whom they had recourse for issue, that the issue male should be sent back. But the female remained with themselves, so that the dominion of the females was in the mother. Or education. If there be no contract, the dominion is in the mother. For in the condition of mere nature, 
Where there are no matrimonial laws, it cannot be known who is the father, unless it be declared by the mother. And therefore the right of dominion over the child dependeth on her will, and is consequently hers. Again, seeing the infant is first in the power of the mother, so as she may either nourish or expose it, if she nourish it, it oweth its life to the mother. And is therefore obliged to obey her, rather than any other, and by consequence the dominion over it is hers. But if she expose it, and another find, and nourish it, the dominion is in him that nourisheth it. For it ought to obey him by whom it is preserved. Because preservation of life being the end, for which one man becomes subject to another, every man is supposed to promise obedience to him, in whose power it is to save or destroy him, or precedent subjection of one of the parents to the other. If the mother be the father's subject, the child is in the father's power. And if the father be the mother's subject, as when a sovereign queen marrieth one of her subjects, the child is subject to the mother, because the father also is her subject. If a man and a woman, monarchs of two several kingdoms, have a child, and contract concerning who shall have the dominion of him, the right of the dominion passeth by the contract. If they contract not, the dominion followeth the dominion of the place of his residence. For the sovereign of each country hath dominion over all that reside therein. He that hath the dominion over the child, hath dominion also over their children's children. For he that hath dominion over the person of a man, hath dominion over all that is his, without which, dominion were but a title, without the effect. The right of succession followeth the rules of the rights of possession. The right of succession to pattern all dominion, proceedeth in the same manner, as doth the right of succession to monarchy, of which I have already sufficiently spoken in the precedent chapter. Despotic all dominion, how attained. Dominion acquired by conquest, or victory in war, is that which some writers call despotical, from despots, which signifieth a lord, or master, and is the dominion of the master over his servant. And this dominion is then acquired to the victor, when the vanquished, to avoid the present stroke of death, covenanteth either in express words, or by other sufficient signs of the will. That so long as his life, and the liberty of his body is allowed him, the victor shall have the use thereof, at his pleasure. And after such covenant made, the vanquished is a servant, and not before. For by the word servant, whether it be derived from savire, to serve, or from servar, to save, which I leave to grammarians to dispute, is not meant a captive, which is kept in prison, or bonds. Till the owner of him that took him, or bought him of one that did, shall consider what to do with him. For such men, commonly called slaves, have no obligation at all. But may break their bonds, or the prison, and kill, or carry away captive their master, justly but one, that being taken, hath corporal liberty allowed him. And upon promise not to run away, nor to do violence to his master, is trusted by him. Not by the victory, but by the consent of the vanquished. It is not therefore the victory, that giveth the right of dominion over the vanquished, but his own covenant. Nor is he obliged because he is conquered, that is to say, beaten, and taken, or put to flight, but because he cometh in, and submitteth to the victor. Nor is the victor obliged by an enemy's rendering himself, without promise of life, to spare him for this his yielding to discretion. Which obliges not the victor longer, than in his own discretion he shall think fit. And that men do, when they demand, as it is now called, quarter, which the Greeks called Zogria, taking alive, is to evade the present fury of the victor, by submission. And to compound for their life, with ransom, or service, and therefore he that hath quarter, hath not his life given, but deferred till farther deliberation. For it is not in yielding on condition of life, but to discretion. And then onely is his life in security, and his service due, when the victor hath trusted him with his corporal liberty. For slaves that work in prisons, or fetters, do it not of duty, but to avoid the cruelty of their taskmasters. The master of the servant, is master also of all he hath, and may exact the use thereof. That is to say, of his goods, of his labor, of his servants, and of his children, as often as he shall think fit. For he holdeth his life of his master, by the covenant of obedience, that is, of owning, and authorizing whatsoever the master shall do. And in case the master, if he refuse, kill him, or cast him into bonds, or otherwise punish him for his disobedience, he is himself the author of the same, and cannot accuse him of injury.
In some of the rights and consequences of both paternal and despotic hall dominion are the very same with those of a sovereign by institution. And for the same reasons, which reasons are set down in the precedent chapter. So that for a man that is monarch of divers nations, whereof he hath, in one the sovereignty by institution of the people assembled, and in another by conquest. That is by the submission of each particular, to avoid death or bonds. To demand of one nation more than of the other, from the title of conquest, as being a conquered nation, is an act of ignorance of the rights of sovereignty. For the sovereign is absolute over both alike, or else there is no sovereignty at all, and so every man may lawfully protect himself, if he can, with his own sword, which is the condition of war. Difference between a family and a kingdom. By this it appears, that a great family if it be not part of some commonwealth, is of itself, as to the rights of sovereignty, a little monarchy. Whether that family consist of a man and his children, or of a man and his servants, or of a man and his children, and servants together, wherein the father of master is the sovereign. But yet a family is not properly a commonwealth, unless it be of that power by its own number, or by other opportunities, as not to be subdued without the hazard of war. For where a number of men are manifestly too weak to defend themselves united, every one may use his own reason in time of danger, to save his own life, either by flight, or by submission to the enemy, as he shall think best. In the same manner as a very small company of soldiers, surprised by an army, may cast down their arms, and demand quarter, or run away, rather than be put to the sword. And thus much shall suffice, concerning what I find by speculation and deduction of sovereign rights from the nature, need, and designs of men in erecting of commonwealths and putting themselves under monarchs, or assemblies entrusted with power enough for their protection. The right of monarchy from Scripture. Let us now consider what the Scripture teacheth in the same point. To Moses, the children of Israel say thus Exodus 20, 19, Speak thou to us, and we will hear thee, but let not God speak to us, lest we die. This is absolute obedience to Moses. Concerning the right of kings, God himself by the mouth of Samuel, Seth, 1 Sam, 8, 11, 12, and this shall be the right of the king you will have to reign over you. He shall take your sons, and set them to drive his chariots, and to be his horsemen, and to run before his chariots, and gather in his harvest, and to make his engines of war, and instruments of his chariots, and shall take your daughters to make perfumes, to be his cooks and bakers. He shall take your fields, your vineyards, and your olive yards, and give them to his servants. He shall take the tydh of your corn and wine, and give it to the men of his chamber, and to his other servants. He shall take your manservants, and your maidservants, and the choice of your youth, and employ them in his business. He shall take the tydh of your flocks, and you shall be his servants. This is absolute power, and summed up in the last words, you shall be his servants. Again, when the people heard what power their king was to have. Yet they consented thereto, and say thus, verse 19 and we will be as all other nations, and our king shall judge our causes, and go before us, to conduct our wars. Here is confirmed the right that sovereigns have, both to the militia, and to all judicature, in which is contained as absolute power, as one man can possibly transfer to another. Again, the prayer of King Solomon to God, was this. 1 Kings 3, 9 Give to thy servant understanding, to judge thy people, and to discern between good and evil. It belongeth therefore to the sovereign to be judge, and to prescribe the rules of discerning good and evil, which rules are laws, and therefore in him is the legislative power. Saul sought the life of David, yet when it was in his power to slay Saul, and his servants would have done it, David forbade them, saying, 1 Sam. 24. 9. God forbid I should do such an act against my Lord, the anointed of God. For obedience of servants St. Paul saith, call. 3. 20. Servants obey your masters in all things, and verse 22. Children obey your parents in all things. There is simple obedience in those that are subject to pattern all or despotic call dominion. Again, math 23. 2. 3. The scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' chair, and therefore all that they shall bid you observe, that observe and do. There again is simple obedience. And St. Paul, title 3. 2. Warn them that they subject themselves to princes, 
and to those that are in authority and obey them. This obedience is also simple. Lastly, our Savior himself acknowledges that men ought to pay such taxes as are by kings imposed, where he says, Give to Caesar that which is Caesar's, and paid such taxes himself. And that the king's word is sufficient to take anything from any subject, when there is need. And that the king is judge of that need, for he himself, as king of the Jews, commanded his disciples to take the assy, an ass's colt to carry him into Jerusalem, saying, Matt. 21. 2. 3. Go into the village over against you, and you shall find a she assy tied, and her colt with her, honey them, and bring them to me. And if any man ask you, what you mean by it, say the Lord hath need of them, and they will let them go. They will not ask whether his necessity be a sufficient title, nor whether he be judge of that necessity, but acquiesce in the will of the Lord. To these places may be added also that of Genesis, Gen. 3, 5, You shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And verse 11, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree, of which I commanded thee thou shouldest not eat? For the cognizance of judicature of good and evil, being forbidden by the name of the fruit of the tree of knowledge. As a trial of Adam's obedience, the devil to inflame the ambition of the woman, to whom that fruit already seemed beautiful, told her that by tasting it, they should be as gods, knowing good and evil. Whereupon having both eaten, they did indeed take upon them God's office, which is judicature of good and evil, but acquired no new ability to distinguish between them aright. And whereas it is said, that having eaten, they saw they were naked. No man hath so interpreted that place, as if they had formerly blind, as saw not their own skins. The meaning is plain, that it was then they first judged their nakedness, wherein it was God's will to create them, to be uncomely, and by being ashamed, did tacitly censure God himself. And thereupon God saith, Hast thou eaten, etc., as if he should say, Doest thou that owest me obedience, take upon thee to judge of my commandments? Whereby it is clearly, though allegorically, signified, that the commands of them that have the right to command, are not by their subjects to be censured, nor disputed. Sovereign power ought in all commonwealths to be absolute. So it appeareth plainly, to my understanding, both from reason and scripture, that the sovereign power, whether placed in one man, as a monarchy, or in one assembly of men, as in popular. And aristocratic all commonwealths, is as great, as possibly men can be imagined to make it. And though of so unlimited a power, men may fancy many evil consequences, yet the consequences of the want of it, which is perpetual war of every man against his neighbor, are much worse. The condition of man in this life shall never be without inconveniences. But there happeneth in no commonwealth any great inconvenience, but what proceeds from the subject's disobedience and breach of those covenants, from which the commonwealth had its being. And whosoever thinking sovereign power too great, will seek to make it less, must subject himself to the power that can limit it, that is to say, to a greater. The greatest objection is, that of the practice, when men ask, where, and when, such power has by subjects been acknowledged. But one may ask them again, when, or where has there been a kingdom long free from sedition and civil war? In those nations, whose commonwealths have been long lived, and not been destroyed, but by foreign war, the subjects never did dispute of the sovereign power. But howsoever, an argument for the practice of men, that have not sifted to the bottom, and with exact reason weighed the causes, and nature of commonwealths, and suffer daily those miseries, that proceed from the ignorance thereof, is invalid. For though in all places of the world, men should lay the foundation of their houses on the sand, it could not thence be inferred, that so it ought to be. The skill of making and maintaining commonwealths consisteth in certain rules, as doth arithmetic and geometry, not, as tennis play, on practice only, which rules, neither poor men have the leisure, nor men that have had the leisure, have hitherto had the curiosity or the method to find out. For more audiobook like this, hit the subscribe button and click on the notification bell so you get notified when we post a new audiobook. Thanks for listening.